got here? 52 minutes? Okay. All right, good night, Shabbos, everyone. This week's Parsha really is the hardest one. We have the second Teichacha, which is more than the first Teichacha that we have in Bukhu Kosai. And we know that the second Tochacha is talking to us. The first Tochacha, we understand to be referring to the Babylonian exile, and that's why it says that you'll be taken and you'll serve other gods, gods of, of gold and silver, you know, the Kesef Azov, and even if they're not worshipping them, meaning to serve those who worship them is also to be slaves. So the ones who worship these, these gods, it's part of our exile. And in this, in this week's Parsha, I don't mean to be disrespectful to our neighbors who, who, who I personally love very much and feel fellowship with, but the, it's the historical truth of what the Jewish people have experienced in this, in this exile, what we, the, the fourth exile, the Roman exile, is that instead of, whereas Leviticus spoke about Kesef Azov, about gods of silver and gold, the, uh, the Tochacha of Deuteronomy speaks of gods of Eitz Ve'evan, that will be taken into captivity, will be enslaved to, to gods of, of stone, of wood and stone. And Nachmanides says the first Tochacha, the Tochacha in Leviticus, Bukhokosai, is as we said, the the Babylonian captivity, and this and this in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28 is talking about our current exile, the Roman exile, the fourth exile. So the Babylonians, we know Nebuchadnezzar set up all kinds of idols, gold and silver, and uh, and forced the Jews to bow down to these to these statues. And in, the, in our current exile, it's Eitz for Evan. It's, it's wood and stone. And again, I don't mean it to be disrespectful to Christians or to Muslims, but I'll be honest, this is what Nachmanides teaches, and it, and it makes a lot of sense, the way he's teaching it, that here Deuteronomy is referring to those that we have, you know, been uh, held in captivity by, and, and, and part of our exile is that we serve uh, people who will practice other religions. The one which venerates the eights, the tree, the wood, the cross, and the one, you know, the, the, the church, the Christianity, and the one that, that venerates the, the, the stone, the kava, uh, the, the stone in, in Mecca and uh, the, our, our Muslim neighbors and and that's our history and and and, 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 and it's interesting that Nachmanides found this in what we read and indeed we've suffered since the temple was destroyed in this exile and this was predicted ahead of time. Anybody wants to know where was God in the Holocaust, as difficult as it is to say, it's already there in the Torah that these things would happen and that we would suffer like this. It's predicted and it's all because of, because of our sins. We're not blaming our captors. We're, we have to look at ourselves and blame ourselves it's not about blaming the victim. It's about self-introspection. You know, if someone else blames a victim, that's distasteful. But if if the victim blames themselves, that's introspective. And And yet, in the midst of all of this, we can sometimes find God there also. Meaning, when things are difficult, 
to thank God for our suffering, to rejoice in suffering, and to find a little bit of light in a lot of darkness. And there's two stories that Rabbi Weinberger told this week in the lecture that I mentioned in the video I, I had earlier today about the Holocaust that bring this home and also help as one of my friends asked to make a, that I should make a video on the Indian of Ahab Sisral. It, 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 it hits home. I should make it clear that the mitzvah of Ahab Yisrael, of love of your fellow Jew, is not racist. Meaning we don't just love people because of the way they were born. We might be worried about them because of the way that they were born if they're not following the proper path. I want to bring them back and feel... Uh, feel in Achrayas, feel a responsibility to bring them back. But that's different than loving them. Chazal say clearly it's Kamocha B'Torah V'Mitzvos. Meaning uh, a Jew has to love first and foremost his fellow pious Jew, not just accidents of birth. And mitzvah to love the convert is a double mitzvah because it's a mitzvah of loving every Jew which he's included the con he she is included that in the, the convert but then beyond that of the the mitzvah you have to miss a gerem to love the convert the same reason uh, so and again it's because they, they dedicated their lives to God Um, and we have to love each other as, as people who are dedicated to God and not and we're not um, we're not just saying oh just because you were born this way we, we love you no that's, that's God is no respecter of persons it's because of Our, our shared faith and yet the thing is is as my friend on Facebook mentioned too many of us that we have shared faith but we have just some different culture don't tend to get along because of the differences in culture and this is a very important thing that we have to overcome I'm not saying that we have to hate Jews who are not particularly pious we do have to hate Jews who hate religion and who fight against religion. That is law. Uh, that's Jewish law. So someone like George Soros, it's a mitzvah to hate such a person. Um, now hate is just a feeling, and that's it. And, uh, but, you know, King David said, Hello, Mesenecha Hashem Esna. Those who hate you, Lord, don't I hate them? Meaning we, we have to follow King David's example, not hating people who are personal enemies. David loved Saul, who was his personal foe, but he was a, a holy man, and so he respected him, and loved him, and, and, and showed that love to Saul, and considered him, and never considered him to be an enemy. That's why he says, on the day that I was I, this is the psalm I sing to, to the Lord on the day that I was saved from all the hand of all of my enemies and from the hand of Saul because he did not consider Saul an enemy. However, the Masani Hashem, those who hate the Lord, those are our enemies because we're God's people. And so if someone makes himself an enemy of God, we have to take that personally. But if someone is our personal enemy, we have to love them. If they're... If they are pious and good Jews, so, you know, and I deal with people, and maybe they, they're annoying, or this or that, and they, maybe they even are disrespectful to me, and, and, and I still love them, and I still show them respect, and I, I try my best, maybe it's, it's not always easy, but our fellow good Orthodox Jews, we have to show respect, 
Um, and it doesn't matter, like my friend said, if you're Ashkenazi, Svardi, Hasidish, Litvish, Yakish, modern Orthodox, Haredi, we, we can disagree, maybe, on, on certain aspects of our, our practices and, and, and even our ideology, but we love, love, love one another. We have to love each other. Uh, that is what we're required to do. And as I said, there's no racial component in there. We don't just love someone just because they're born Jewish and someone who's not born Jewish and, but joins our faith, we love them. And also, we, we don't hate non-religious Jews and we don't hate Gentiles and we can love them, but we're obligated to love our fellow pious Jews. We can still love non-religious Jews and Gentiles, but it's not a mitzvah the way it is to love the, the fellow. Um, and, and, and it's generally a bigger challenge to love the fellow Orthodox Jew. You know, because we, we have, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. And so we, we have to uh, overcome that temptation. To, to, to have enemies. We have to love each other. You know, to the point where Chazal say, the Mishnah says, uh, Jews are not suspected that they, uh, an enemy is someone you don't talk to them for three days out of anger. And, and the Mishnah says, that no Jew would do such a thing. Jews are not suspected of doing such a horrible thing. To not talk to someone? It's unheard of. Can you imagine? Um... That's what the Mishnah tells us. But back to, since the Tochacha is, is our subject of this week's Parsha, and the Holocaust is the biggest example of the fulfillment of this prophecy, but we have to look for God in that dark place. So, three stories I heard from Rabbi Weinberger, two that we heard in our in the lecture that was earlier this week in Chicago and one more so the first two that I'd never heard before one it's not exactly related to this but somewhat related to it and all the things I just said about Ahav Israel, I should say I heard this personally from Rabbi Victor Miller it's on the tape Diamonds in the Road you can hear me on the tape when I was a kid asking the question and Rabbi Miller giving me the answer um, back to the stories, three stories from Rabbi Weinberger related to the Holocaust. And I don't like to talk about the Holocaust. I find it very depressing. The only time I really like to talk about the Holocaust is to talk about the people who didn't lose their faith and, and the miracle of that. So let's 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 go through first the story of the Radishit Rabbi Hashem Yim Kumdama, may the Lord avenge his blood, who was murdered by the Nazis. And the story goes in the Lodge Ghetto. The Nazis knew Yom Kippur was coming and they and they, they cemented shut all the mikvahs. They claimed, oh, it's a health hazard or something. Just like they said with the beards, and we'll talk about that in the next story. And the, the story goes was that in Lodz there was several mikvahs, and one of them, a Jew, his apartment was right next door to the mikvah. And what he managed to do, him and a few of his friends, is that they worked with picks and shovels and spoons and forks and who knows what, and managed to break a hole through the wall to get into the mikveh. A Jew finds a way. And so, they tried to keep it a secret. But they, they sent a bacher with Monsieur Snefish, a teenager. He would get killed if he got caught going out after curfew. 
but the, with the addresses of whatever Rebbe's were there in the ghetto, and again, like I said, they were all, they, their beards were robbed from them and so forth. They, their dignity was robbed from them. And, but they, they got to, uh, the, the word was spread out, it was supposed to only be for the Rebbe's. Because if they want to go to the mikveh, Erev Yom Kippur, there's such a thing available. You have to crawl through a basement, through a hole in the wall, but there's such a thing. So, Radha Shitzer Rebbe said, you know, it's Erev Yom Kippur, Madaf Gain, you have to go. So him and the Gaba, the Rebbe was killed, but the Gaba survived and told the story. Like Rabbi Weinberger said, you know, when <laughs> a, a, a secret is uh, is something that uh, uh, by a Jew you tell one person at a time. <laughs> so so Rada uh, Shitzurabik Hashem Kamdama is Khusia he gets there, crawls in through the hole, him the Gabba go through the mikveh, and what do you know there's like a hundred people there waiting to to toil and quickly the Rebbe's standing there, he's crying, he said, Look at how Bernish, look at how holy your Jews are. Look, they, they lost a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a wife, children, everything. And, 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 and they're in the darkest time in history, and yet they find all these people lost something, yet they find, they find uh, all they want is a little bit of hope. Mikvah's, tikvah's hope. It's the first story. The second story is just amazing. You know the Kleisenberger Rebbe, Zechus Egeleno, he, he went through such hell, lost 11 children and a wife, and, and after the war, he got remarried and, and have a lot of children. I know he had well, like four or five children. After the war, I know two sons and two or three daughters. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, he built back you know, everything he lost. He built back the the Kloisenberg dynasty. He has his two sons who are the new Rebbe's. I mean, this, they've been Rebbe for 20 years now, but... And, and his son-in-law, the, the Zwilla Rebbe, Zuchus Yegelenu, who I remember, I, I had the Shaykhs with him, he was my neighbor, and his other son-in-law, who's my neighbor, Rabbi Prashant, who's a Rav now in, in Union City, very Choshva Rav, Rebbe, and um, so he is this Kloisenberger Rebbe. Rabbi Weinberger said he heard this from someone who heard it from the Kloisenberger Rebbe. Kloisenberger Rebbe said, you know what I miss about the Holocaust? Can you imagine saying such a thing? I told the guys in prison when I told them the story today, I said, you're going to leave this place at some point in the future, and there's going to be something that you miss. You can't believe it now, but at some point you're going you're gonna to miss, miss this place. And this place is not, it's not, it's not the Holocaust, you know. But, you know, and it, it sounds... Uh, it sounds, you know, you know, disrespectful, like Larry David says, you know, like, that they get together and talk about old times, you know, <laughs> but, uh, it's, uh, and, and, and I understand, you know, that it's, it's, it's hurtful to even ask such a thing, you know, but this, the truth is, someone like the Kloisenberger Rebbe, he saw God in everything, and everywhere, and he talked about, well, what, what did he miss? about the Holocaust. Can you imagine such a thing, to say such a thing? This, this is how a tzaddik can talk. So he said, now you have to understand, like I mentioned, all the tzaddikim, except one, had their beards robbed from them. It was only, only His Holiness, the Satmarav, Zuchusi Yagin Yisrael Main, the Nazis, they, they checked the uh, Hatarena Bard, he has a clean beard, they let him they let him keep the beard, and another time he'd pretend to have a toothache, so he he wouldn't have to, you know, um, 
um, so so anyway so he said the uh, What did he miss? He said when they were all there on these marches, these death marches, and it was cold out. You looked around, they all, everyone looked the same. Nobody had a beard. Nobody had a yarmulke on. You didn't know who was a Rebbe, who was Rashiva, who was Hasidish, who was Litvish, who was Yekish, who was from, who was who was Napikaris. You didn't know. All you knew was you were cold and you, uh, you, you, you put out your arm to the next guy and 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 he put it out his arm and, and you kept each other a little warm that, that's 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 he said he misses that he misses that warmth and he misses that where you didn't you didn't know who was who because we were all the same and that and that brings us that brings us to, to, to our last story. Uh, we know that one time, I think more, maybe more than once, Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik from Yeshiva University He went to visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe at the at the Farbrengen in Crown Heights, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe showed him a lot of covered Rosh Hashiba. Sat next to it's next to me. They sat sat next to each other, and and and, and Rabbi Yosher you should know his malamed when he was a kid was a Lubavitcher Chosid, so he, he had a certain connection there. But you know he was. Ben Archer Ben from Chaim Velazhener, right? Ben Ben Archer Ben, but an Einikel from Chaim Velazhener, right? The Salavechiks are Einikel from Chaim Velazhener. Believe Ben Archer Ben, and and uh, Chaim Velazhener was the student of Vilner Gon, right? And so Lubavitcher Rebbe said to to. Uh, to the Rav of Boston, to, to Rabbi Soloveitchik, he said, uh, he said, look at what, what, what's uh, come true here. The world of the Baal Shem Tov and the world of, of the Vilner Gon, finally we can sit together. The fight is over. These two worlds have come together in unity. And uh, on the way back, some of the Bachram who went with Rav Soloveitchik, they were in the car together with him, and they asked him, what did he think, and how did he enjoy the Farbrengen and everything, and Rav Soloveitchik said he enjoyed it very much, the Nagunim, and the Torah, the Chassidus, and everything, the Rebbe, but one thing, he said, when the Rebbe said that we were brought together here in Crown Heights, he said, this isn't where the Hasidim and the Litvaks came together. It, it was in Auschwitz. There it didn't matter if you were a Hasid or Litvak. Is there. These are the lessons we have to take home. You know, all the tzaddikim, you know, you know Baba Sali, you're going to ask about the Sephardim also. Baba Sali was once moved into a town, a, 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 I'm not going to mention the name of the town, and the robe of the town said something negative against the Baal Shem Tov and the uh, Baba Sali got up and moved away, he said, I cannot live in a town where the tzaddikim are insulted, I can't live in such a place, so he moved away. I hate moving. That's one thing I hate is moving. You know, I'll pay a ridiculous amount of rent 
in a house that's too small, just as long as I don't have to move. Oh, that's what I'm doing right now. And, and I'm thinking of buying this house that's too small, just so I don't have to move. But, uh, the Baba Sala, he got up and moved. Because he could not live in a, in a town where, where the Baal Shem Tov is being insulted. And that's the way we're supposed to live as Jews. It doesn't matter, Sephardi, Ashkenazi, Hasidish, Litvish, we have to love and respect each other. And, and you know, the Baba Sali's son, who I saw once, got a bracha from once, he was killed, the Baba Lazar, Hashem Yim from Dama. Uh, the story goes when the Baba Lazar heard that the Samarov was Nifter, he was in the middle of a haircut, and he, um, he said, all right, this is over. I'm not, I'm, how can I cut my hair? He, and so he was with half a haircut for, for the Shloishim of Samarov. You know, I mean, as much as I'm upset to lose the Sklena Rebbe. And I'm sure I was probably by Sklena Rebbe more than the Baba Lazar was by Samarov. Uh, I can't imagine doing such a thing. But this is what it means to have a Habas Yisrael that crosses the lines of the different cultures. To re recognize the, the tzaddikim, that's I think the first key to that. If, you're, if you can feel comfortable with the tzaddikim that you disagree with, and with Er Lechidim that you disagree with, not only that you have a different culture from them, you don't disagree with, I, I, I went out of my way. I was at a conference once a year or two ago, and Rabbi Avi Weiss was there. Obviously, I agree with Rabbi Weiss on certain things, and some people fault me for that. And most things, obviously, we agree on. We, we, so the 613 mitzvahs, we agree. But uh, I went out of my way to... Um, talk to him and and he's a lovely person he's an absolutely lovely person and uh, and, and yes I can disagree with him but I, I, I can't bring myself to disrespect him uh, and I feel very comfortable talking to him Feel, you know, I only talked to him really once. I've only even seen him twice. You know. Um, but I, I, I have respect for him. I do. Um, the same thing would be whoever you want to talk about. Even, even though I'm very upset at Rabbi Mark Angel for uh, his support of Yafet. Uh, I still respect him. I still like him. Um, it, it, it's upsetting and hurtful, but I know he's, he's said some upsetting and hurtful things in the past. And the same thing with Herschel Schechter said certain things that I find very uncomfortable, but I still, I, I met him once, spoke to him once, and I like him. He's a little different than those other two. He's more... He's frumer. And he's more serious. Um, also, he, he's a, a great man. And, 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 and the same thing. Talk about the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Kleisenberger Rebbe, people who maybe in my community are a little bit controversial. But I still love them. I, I don't like when Lubavitcher Rebbe is turned into a figure that's larger than life. 
and I feel that's a, a certain amount of disrespect to him that that approached him. But but I love him. I still go to the oil, leave a kvittel. He's a rebel like all the other rebels. And and when you can accomplish that, then you can accomplish. When then the next step is is the Havas Yisrael for the Havon Am. And the, and the biggest challenge is the Havas Yisrael for those who are who annoy you, who maybe are mean to you, maybe who bully you, disrespect you, uh, and maybe have some financial disagreement or some other disagreement, and, and to still say, Afal I love you despite everything unconditionally and I, although it might hurt what you do to me and it's and I'll even say it's wrong what you do to me but I still love you and I still respect you and I know it's difficult to, to do something like that uh oh looks like there's nobody here the mikveh, who's going to be, who's going to say, so thank you for watching, God bless, please like, share, and subscribe, comment, have a good shopping.